This morning, we heard our wonderful rabbinic intern, Emma Dubin, chant from Parashat Vayera so beautifully. And as Emma shared in her introduction, this portion includes many of our tradition's most well-known stories. Abraham opening his tent to the three strangers, Abraham arguing with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt, Isaac's birth, Ishmael and Hagar's banishment, the binding of Isaac, and so much more. But throughout this portion, like so many in Genesis, there is one resounding theme, legacy. Who will carry on the legacy of Abraham? Who will continue the covenant? Who will ensure that this sacred relationship between God and humanity will live on? We see this profound concern with legacy when Sarah learns that she will conceive a son. We see it when Isaac is born and again when Sarah decides to cast out Ishmael. And we see this concern with legacy perhaps most acutely when Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah. Was it the necessity of legacy that saves Isaac in the end? For so many of us, the question of legacy looms large in our lives. We work so hard to build communities, to sustain our faiths, to live lives of decency and integrity. How do we ensure that these values live on even after we're gone? These questions have many answers, but today we will explore just one the idea of creating a lasting legacy and living on through organ donation. Of course, many of us learned about the sanctity of living on through organ donation when Cantor Glasman donated one of his kidneys to his mother. We will continue that learning today. This morning, we are so honored to welcome Rabbi Joshua Rabin to our bima. Rabbi Rabin comes to us from Live On New York. Live On is a nonprofit organization committed to helping New Yorkers live on through organ and tissue donation by facilitating such donations and transplants throughout the greater New York City area. Live On's teams work with local hospitals and transplant centers to deliver the gift of life to thousands of New Yorkers currently waiting for a life-saving organ transplant. Made up of over 300 clinicians, educators, social workers, and more, Live On works tirelessly on education, engagement, advocacy, and logistical planning and management to help save the lives of those in need of a transplant. Live On also provides support and comfort to donors and their loved ones throughout the donation process and for years after as well. Rabbi Joshua Rabin serves as a community and government affairs liaison at Live On New York, specifically focusing his work and advocacy on the Jewish community. In addition to his sacred work at Live On, Rabbi Rabin also serves as the rabbi of the Astoria Center of Israel in Astoria, Queens. Furthermore, he is an experienced nonprofit executive and educator with over 10 years of experience in leadership development, education, fundraising, and innovation. Rabbi Rabin received his rabbinic ordination and certificate in pastoral counseling from the Jewish Theological Seminary in 2011 and completed executive education at institutions including Harvard Business School, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, and the Disney Institute. Rabbi Rabin is a recipient of the Wexner Field Fellowship and the Ruske Fellowship for Jewish Professional Leadership. He lives on the Upper West Side with his wife, Rabbi Yael Hammerman, and they are the proud parents of Hannah, Shai, and Ella. What a privilege it is to welcome Rabbi Joshua Rabin to our bima, 
to speak about the extraordinary mitzvah of organ donation. Rabbi Rabin. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom and good morning. It's such a privilege to be able to spend a little bit of time with all of you this morning. I think the last time I was in this sanctuary was a trip I took with my confirmation class to New York City. And I want to start off this morning by thanking uh, Rabbi Sepadin for her invitation to speak today. It's a strange topic to be a rabbi whose rabbinate involves organ donation. It's not that organ donation is per se a strange topic, it's just that there aren't a lot of us in the club who get paid salaries to do this. And that's because organ donation is one of these topics that when people are asked about it on one foot, as we say in Judaism, usually the approval rating is quite high. It's a hard thing to be against. But that is sort of a double-edged sword because something that has such a high approval rating yet has such a large gap in terms of our aspirations for what we need to address this problem creates this odd dissonance where we don't talk about a topic but all of us kind of agree that it's valuable and all the while thousands of people in this state and millions of people around the world suffer due to the lack of having a life-saving organ. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And I want to first talk about it in the context of this morning's Torah portion, which Rabbi Dubin read so beautifully a few minutes ago about the story of Hagar. I'm a huge fan of the story of Hagar, not the least of which being that it's often the non-Israelite, or what we might call the non-Jewish characters in the Torah who teach us the most profound insights about ourselves. And so in Hagar's story where she's sent away by Abraham and Sarah, she goes with her son Yishmael to the wilderness and as is often the case in the wilderness, she doesn't know where she's going to find food or water to feed her child. And so she says, I don't want to look at my son while he dies. And at that moment, God comes and intervenes. And it says, as Rabbi Dubin read a few minutes ago, then God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw a well of water. She filled the skin with water and let the boy drink. A very simple passage, but there's one problem. It never actually says in the Torah that Hagar ever closed her eyes. It just says that God opened them. And as is fitting in Jewish tradition, whenever there's something obvious that's lacking in the text, our rabbis want to know why. There's lots of answers given for it. My favorite one has always come from a midrash where Rabbi Benjamin states that all are presumed to be blind until the Holy One, blessed be God, opens their eyes. It's not that Hagar literally closed her eyes, it's that in a particular moment she couldn't see clearly that which was right in front of her. And so God opened her eyes. For the last few weeks, I've been asking myself, what do people see that I don't? And what could I see, but fail to see because I choose not to look at it with such soft eyes? The Midrash is a reminder that this happens more often than we'd like to think. Things can be right in front of us, and yet we choose not to see either because we're too busy or too tired or too sad to notice. And it's particularly hard because 
As I've thought about those questions, I've also asked myself, what would it take for human beings to recognize how much we are all the same? What would it take for them to see their shared humanity with each other? And then I show up to work at Live On New York and I remember how much we are all the same. As Rabbi Sepadin mentioned, Live On New York is a nonprofit organization. We are not a Jewish organization. We are designated by the federal government to handle deceased organ and tissue donation in anywhere between Staten Island and Poughkeepsie. So all of the five boroughs, Long Island, Westchester, Rock Island, Orange, Dutchess County. If you hear on the news or hear about someone who, for example, passes away on Long Island and their heart was donated to someone who lives in Queens or in Rockland County, we are the ones at the nexus of making that happen. Everything from being the people who show up in the hospital and ask the family for their blessing to give this gift of life to ensuring that there is a way for these organs to be recovered from a person and then transferred to a transplant center where they can be given to someone else, to providing aftercare for the family that has to engage in grief and shock over how they lost their loved one in the first place. We'll come back to that. Our bodies don't know what religion we practice. They don't know what language we speak or what race, soul, or ethnic category we're placed into. They don't know how much money we make and they don't know who we voted for for President of the United States. And every day, hearts, lungs, kidneys, and other vital organs are donated by ordinary people to other ordinary people. People who, under different circumstances, might have had no reason to interact with each other. And when it happens, organ donation turns people and families who neither sought nor invited tragedy into heroes. People like Roger Kwok, a Gulf War veteran and city sanitation worker who died and saved the lives of four others through organ donation. People like Bella Treza, a teenager from West Babylon, New York, who died in a car crash and saved three lives out of the ashes of her tragedy. Or people like Billy Moon, a firefighter from Islip who died in a training exercise and whose family created a foundation to support donor and recipient families through lodging, food, transportation, and other ways to ease the difficulty associated with sick and dying loved ones. Or people like Gavri Benson, a 16-year-old student from the LaFell School in Westchester County who died and donated four organs and whose family made the decision that on his tombstone there would be the statement that he died a halakhic organ donor, an organ donor who donated out of his conviction that Jewish law demands it. These stories happen every day. Ordinary people from all walks of life. And yet it doesn't happen enough. In the state of New York alone, there are 9,000 people waiting for a life-saving organ. 8,000 of those are in the area that Live On New York covers. This means effectively that almost one New Yorker dies every day waiting for a life-saving transplant. And those New Yorkers are everywhere, including in our own backyard. In this congregation's zip code, 10065, there are eight people who have been waiting for a transplant. Thus far, only one of them has received a life-saving organ. One out of eight is not a great number, but unfortunately, it's fairly typical. Almost every place I go when I look up those statistics, you find that the number of people who need organs versus the ones who receive them to be highly imbalanced. And the number of people in the zip code who actually were donors in the past year is zero. Now again, this is more common than you might think, but it means that every person who does receive a transplant receives it from somewhere else. 
And once you start adding up those numbers, it doesn't become hard to understand how there are 9,000 people on a waiting list. And so my colleagues and I go out everywhere we possibly can to speak about this. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, most people are in favor of organ donation. Even if they might have concerns about it or questions, we're going to come back to that in a moment, it's a hard thing to be against. And yet the challenge of actually addressing this problem continues to persist. And believe it or not, the Jewish community tends to still under-register to be organ donors. This is in spite of the fact that I happen to be a conservative ordained rabbi. I don't actually know a single conservative or reform rabbi who is opposed to organ donation. And yet the numbers are still lower than the population on average. Some of this are for some common myths that I'd like to bust for you this morning. First, and most importantly, yes, you can be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you donate their organs. Many people think this is not the case and that you're supposed to leave this world as you came in. In an ideal world, we would all do that. But no synagogue that I know would refuse to bury someone because they had to have their appendix removed or their gallbladder or was an amputee or had their tonsils or their adenoids removed, whatever it might be. We would never say that about anything else. So why would our tradition prohibit it in the case where someone leaves their heart to save the life of another? The answer is, we don't prohibit it, but a lot of us think we do. And while there are segments of the Jewish community that believe that there might be some point one day where we live in a messianic age when where people can come back to life, some people ask, well, does that mean that if I donate my heart now, I'll miss out on this far, far, far away miracle? Maimonides answered a thousand years ago, the answer is no. You can't take it with you, as they like to say. And while, of course, in Jewish tradition, we place a high premium on burying people as fast as possible and treating the body with the utmost care, all of those customs are superseded by the mitzvah of pekuach nefesh, of saving a life above all others. And so these are some reasons why, in spite of widespread support among rabbinic authorities across the Jewish spectrum for deceased organ donation, that the Jewish community tends to under-register. But it's not just us. It's communities of all shapes and kinds because people wonder things that no one ever bothered to explain to them. For example, Will the hospital work as hard to save me if I register on my driver's license as an organ donor? The answer is, of course, because we live on New York are not the hospital. The hospital and us are separate. We have separate jobs. The hospital's job is to keep a person alive. Our job is to enter the picture when that's no longer possible and have a conversation about next steps. Number two, people send us self-disqualify. I'm too sick. I'm too old. Who could ever possibly want my organs? The oldest known person in New York to pass away and donate their organs was 94 years old, just this past year. That person, by the way, beat the previous record holder from over three years ago who was 93. Doesn't mean that every person who has the miracle of living to 94 will be a good organ donor candidate. No, probably not. But you have nothing to lose by saying that it's a value that you want to mark about yourself. And you'll let the doctors decide if and when that comes. Because the other reason why a lot of these myths persist is because cases where people end up donating their organs are some of the most sudden and tragic ways that people can die. If you look on our chart that monitors every day all of the potential cases, you'll see 
Events like car crashes, drownings, gunshot wounds, drug overdoses, suicide attempts. These are ways that people leave this world that leave shock and grief for all the people that they left behind. It's not something that anyone wakes up one morning and says, this is gonna be my last day on earth. And so when that person is sitting there in a hospital somewhere with that grave prognosis and their medical team has to tell their loved ones that they're not coming back. It's a hard time to have a first conversation about busting do myths about organ donation because that's not the number one thing on people's minds. And as a rabbi, from a pastoral standpoint, I can't blame them. There are other things that people are concerned about in that moment. And so if you've never thought about it, if you've never made your wishes clear to the people who will make medical decisions about you, it's very easy to decide, even if you in your heart believe that it's the right thing to do, it's very easy to decide that, at least for today, it's not the right time for me. And what I ask people to think about is that when will it be the right time? There is no right time. And there's certainly no right time for the people who are on the waiting list. Every single day though, people remind us that this current situation doesn't have to be our reality. It's only the reality if we choose to keep it that way. And so it might be the case that this is a non-issue for you. You may already be registered on your driver's license to be an organ donor. You may have already done your advanced medical directives and told your next of kin what your wishes are. And if you've done all that, then you've done your job. And I say thank you. And if you haven't, it's never too late. You can register with pamphlets that I brought with me when you go to the DMV. If you get a New York City ID, you can register when you register to vote. You can register when you become an American citizen at a naturalization ceremony. You can do it online. You can do it by paper. You can do it any way you want. And once you do that, you've made your wishes clear. And tell the person you love who's going to make decisions about you what you want. Have it written down. And then it's clear. Because if it happens, that you are that person who can be that hero, the situation's gonna be out of your hands. And so you have to take control of that situation now. And while I don't wish upon anyone I meet in this job that they will one day be that person who is an organ donor hero, if it is you, or if it is someone out there that you know or love, that person will be someone who someone else out there never knew their name the day before, but will never forget it for the rest of their lives. In Jewish tradition, we teach that any action done for a person who has died is considered an act of what we call chesed shel emet, which means a true act of kindness. Chesed is the word kindness. It comes from the same root as the term gimilut chasadim, and emet means truth. It's basically the idea of what we would call a truly selfless act of generosity. And it comes from later in Sefer Breshid in the book of Genesis where Jacob is about to die and he says to his son Joseph, do for me this chesed shel emet, do for me this true act of kindness, and don't bury me in the land of Egypt. It's the reason why even hundreds of years after the Israelites are enslaved, when they return to the land of Canaan, they return with Jacob's bones. Our medieval commentator Rashi says that actions done for people who have died are acts of chesed shel emet because there is no possibility that they can repay you.
And as beautiful as Rashi's commentary is, today we are fortunate that it is incomplete. Because thanks to the brilliance of medical science and dedicated professionals, organ donation enables us to have people who have died do true acts of kindness for the living. Because if you're a person in need of a life-saving organ, and that organ comes from someone who died in one of those tragic and sudden ways, and they save your life, you'll never be able to pay them back. But you'll never forget their name. That's what Rabbi Sepeda meant when she talked about the idea of legacy. Some of us will get to choose what our legacy is, and some of us will have our legacy change in a moment's notice. But organ donation is a reminder that when those moments happen, we remember the common bonds that we all share as people, common bonds that we need to recognize now more than ever. And so I ask you, be a donor hero. Live on through the gift of organ donation and pass on the message to someone else. Shabbat Shalom, and thank you for having me.